I'm going to, um, in a second, introduce um, Ken Stearns, who's working with us, who's going to then introduce our speaker. I just want to say a, a, a couple words. Um, the talk tonight is, is about a, a, a very controversial topic, uh, one that um, many of you feel strongly about. Uh, it, it's, it's quite reminiscent of, and the controversy around it is a controversy that has emerged because um, for good and other reasons, people have become committed to a narrative. And in becoming committed to a narrative, uh, often you so identify yourself with that narrative and the truth of that narrative that when facts come up that question it, you have to, in a sense, deny the reality of those facts rather than give up that narrative which has structured your lives and gives it meaning. This is actually the argument that Han Arendt makes about the essence of totalitarian movements in her book, The Origins of Totalitarianism. And um, I will say I don't know the facts of the Matthew Shepard case. I have done no research. I'll admit to having not read the book. I apologize. Um, but I've been fascinated with the story and with the work of our speaker, Stephen Jimenez. And um, it's, it's, it's something that what Whatever you end up coming out thinking after today, being forced to confront this ability of movements to form and hold on to narratives is deeply important. And so I'm glad that he's here today. But I'm going to now introduce Ken Stern, who is working, who, um, is working with the Hannah Arendt Center on a project that we're developing together called Hate in the Human Condition. Exploring hate and how to teach about hate in liberal arts. I'd like to welcome Ken, who's the one who brought Stephen here, and we'll introduce Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Echo is, uh, thanks to all of you for coming tonight, and I'm not going to take too long uh, before introducing Steve, but I want to give you a little bit of background. I'm also a Bard alum, I graduated in '75, and uh, my, my day jobs, I work on issues of, of human rights, anti-Semitism, extremism, and so forth. Steve is actually a high school classmate of mine. Um, and we, you know, had not been really, you know, close buddies, but we got along pretty well. And we sort of, you know, had a disconnect from each other. And then we got together at our 40th reunion. And we happened to be sitting next to each other when we all went out to uh, dinner. And he knew about my work in, in human rights. I've been very active in promoting legislation about hate crimes. Uh, I you know, co-authored uh, amicus briefs, uh, you know, proposing uh, hate crime legislation or defending hate crimes legislation. Um, and we got to talking, and he was telling me he was working on this project. And he was, he was a journalist and had been working on the Matthew Shepard case. And I said, well, that's interesting because I was very well aware of the Matthew Shepard case, as a matter of fact. I knew mean, uh, Judy Shepard, Matthew's mom, and she and I had both uh, keynoted different parts of a hate crimes conference a couple of years before that. And he started telling me, you know, what you think you know about the case may not actually be what happened. And so this is pretty interesting. Um, so he told me a little bit of detail, but it was just a, a taste. And that was in, in 2011. Flip forward uh, a couple of years, and his book is coming out. And I get an advanced copy from uh, his publisher, uh, Chip, who's here. And I read it, and it's, I'm not going to steal Steve's thunder, but it's very detailed and very compelling that there's a, a lot more to the story than most of us thought about. And then I realized, oh my god, poor Steve is going to get vilified for this. And what I flash back to my own experience in my day job was an experience back um, when you guys were very, very little, when I, I uh, had written an expose of a, a, a documentary called The Liberators. And The Liberators came out after the Crown Heights riots about two years later. Black Jewish relations were very, very um, antagonistic after that, in New York in particular. And here was this film that somebody put together, actually two filmmakers, a black filmmaker and a Jewish filmmaker, about this unit of called the 761st Tank Battalion that was an all-black unit the, you know, the, during World War II, there was segregation in the military, that had supposedly liberated Dachau and Buchenwald. And I started seeing these um, uh, 
veterans and others saying, well, you know, the story isn't actually true. That they had a lot of heroic things, they fought <coughs> for the tree, they went and served with honor, uh, they actually did liberate some sub camps, but not Doc Cowan Buchenwald. And there was a whole big explosion and a lot of vilification of what, it's a great story, how could you destroy it? And my point was, here are these veterans that fought to have uh, their history told accurately, um, and the documentation, if you look at I just spent two weeks, Steve spent you know, 13 years, showed that while they did heroic things, they didn't do what the myths said that they did. And there was a lot of pushback. So I saw a great parallel between you know, my small little two-week investigation of a film and Steve's dealing with a, a, an iconic uh, story that was a, a, an important propulsion for the understanding about the need for hate crimes legislation. So it was in that context that I read the book, and I said, as, as Roger was saying, we're trying to build an initiative here at BART, looking at issues of human hatred, this is the perfect place to have a discussion about this. You know, Steve can go to other places and talk about you know, the facts, but here at BART, I know the capacity to really look at the issues and to think about them critically and to understand what, what the importance of truth, what the importance of myth, uh, how do you understand historical events, how do you determine what's the truth, uh, are all critical things. So without further ado, we turn over to Steve. Thanks, Ken. Thank you, Roger. It's really a pleasure to be here um, tonight. Uh, for one thing, I wish I could go back and go to college and start over and be at a place like this because it looks like a great place to, um, to kind of study uh, just a beautiful environment. What I'd like to do is just tell you a little bit first about how I came to the story uh, because I went to Laramie in early 2000 to write one story uh, as, a, as a screenplay for a made-for-television movie and ended up finding, uh, after I was there about eight months in Laramie, after I'd made several visits, I began to find some other information that suggested there was much more to this story than what had originally been reported. But as a gay man uh, who's been out since the 1970s, when I heard uh, about the attack on Matthew Shepard, like so many people around the country, um, I was horrified by the grotesque violence of the attack, um, I was frightened by it. I had spent time in Wyoming several years before Matthew was killed, and I, I felt that I knew the landscape, and in many ways had kind of fallen in love with the people there. So it had this added dimension of shock. But uh, I didn't decide to go to Laramie immediately after the crime happened. It was a little more than a year later when Aaron McKinney, the principal perpetrator of Matthew's murder, was convicted and sentenced, and I read the statement, or the part of the statement that was printed in the New York Times that Dennis Shepard, Matthew's father, made. And it was a very, very moving statement that drove home to me what the cost of the murder had been for Matthew's family, his parents, his brother, his friends, and the whole community. And it was when I read that that I was really moved to go to Laramie. So my first trip was in February of 2000. McKinney had been convicted in November, the prior November. And one thing that was of interest to me is that the court record, everything that was in the court record, that included uh, witness statements, police reports, transcripts, you know, all the key evidence had been under seal for a year by the court. And all witnesses in the case had been under a gag order. People that worked in the courthouse were also under a gag order. Law enforcement, people that worked for the defense attorneys. So when I arrived there, this was going to be part of a, an, you know, an educational process for me in terms of educating myself, research for what I thought would be a screenplay, because I thought this was such an important case that it really deserved a full-length treatment. And uh, the first day I was in the courthouse, I was going through documents in the courthouse, and you know they brought out reams, stacks of material, and I started taking notes. And I noticed the prosecutor in the case, his name is Cal Maruka, just 
you know, he was walking through in the county attorney's office and talking to some of the staff. And I just went up and introduced myself and asked him if he had uh, a little time to talk about the case with me. And he agreed. And I went in. And the first conversation with him lasted about 45 minutes. He was uh, very suspicious of my motives initially. Uh, he told me that um, he wouldn't be part of anything that, it, that could inflict more pain on Matthew Shepard's family. Uh, but we concluded the conversation that day, and he agreed that he would help educate me about the case. So over the next several months, uh, after I returned, I, I was living back east at the time, uh, I began doing a series of long phone interviews with him. Ultimately, you know, after quite a long period of time, I did something like 100, it was about 150 hours of interviews with the prosecutor. But initially, it began with that first one, and I did return to Laramie over the next several months. Eight months later, I had finished a first draft of the script. I had talked to a few other people in Laramie, some people in law enforcement, some people that worked at the Fireside Bar where Matthew Shepard met uh, his assailants that night. You know, and I kept hearing rumors around town that there was more to the story, people suggesting that uh, maybe, you know, Matthew Shepard and, and Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson had known each other, but they were just rumors at that point. But after the eight months, I went back and I had a first draft of the screenplay, and I asked the prosecutor if he would go through the script and just write down notes if I had misstated things, if there were inaccuracies, if I had gotten anything wrong, because I was going to send a first draft of the script to a producer in Los Angeles I was working with. So on a Saturday in, in October, uh, we were at the courthouse, and he took a copy of the screenplay, went to his office down the hall. I went to the law library down the hall in the courthouse to wait while he was reading the screenplay. And he had made available a lot of his documents, but there were also folders full of newspaper articles, because obviously this had been covered by the media in Wyoming, but also the national media. And I had accumulated my own file at that point, but I also wanted to see if there was anything maybe I had missed from the local papers, from the Laramie Boomerang or the Casper Star Tribune, or one of the local Wyoming papers. And as I was going through one of the folders, uh, I came upon a uh, handwritten letter. Uh, I quickly flipped and saw on the second page of the letter that it was an anonymous letter, but it was written to the prosecutor. And the letter essentially said, I knew from the letter that it had been written either during Aaron McKinney's trial, the previous uh, late October, November, or soon after it, because the letter said Aaron McKinney's gay panic defense that he used in his trial was false. That Aaron McKinney uh, was very comfortable with gay guys, he'd been to gay bars, and it said actually that he really enjoyed you know, the companion should be around gay males. He really, you know, that he had been sexually involved with gay males. So, I don't, I don't know how familiar you are with the gay panic defense, but essentially the gay panic defense said that Matthew Shepard made a sexual advance on Aaron McKinney, an unwanted <coughs> sexual advance, and that caused Aaron McKinney to explode in rage. So, in the letter, there was a, um, there was a person that I had read about in Laramie, a kind of notorious uh, individual by the name of Doc O'Connor. Those of you here who have been involved with the Laramie Project uh, know that Doc O'Connor is, you know, is an important figure in the play. Uh, in the HBO version, if you've seen that, he was portrayed by Steve uh, Buscemi. Anyway, in the letter it mentioned that Doc O'Connor was one of Aaron McKinney's gay friends. And it referred to the fact that Aaron McKinney sometimes exchanged favors, sex, you know, favors of some kind or got money in exchange for, for sexual activity. But it was Doc's name that really caught my attention because I had read about him in a number of articles. He was written about in Newsweek and Time and Vanity Fair. What caught my attention is knowing that Doc O'Connor had also been a friend of Matthew Shepard. And here it was, this letter, was mentioning Doc O'Connor in relationship to Aaron McKinney. So obviously, an anonymous uh, letter is not something that you could use as evidence in a court case. 
it's not something that you could use as being reliable uh, information, you know, in journalism. But it was enough that it planted a seed. It, it planted some questions for me. And I just didn't feel comfortable, even, I, you know, I completed the screenplay, sending it on to the producer in LA. I set, I set the screenplay aside. And this was really the beginning of a long, long period of questioning and research and investigation for me. Um, I'm just going to hit some of the, uh, summarize for you a couple of the important, you know, junctures along the way. During the year 2001, I did a lot of independent investigation. I went back to Laramie several times. I talked to a lot of people in town. I, I sought out sources that uh, were involved in the, in, you know, in the circumstances around the crime. And that was across the board. Again, it was law enforcement. It was people that knew Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson, the other perpetrator, that knew Matthew Shepard. In early 2002, I pitched the story to the New York Times Magazine. And the New York Times Magazine, based on what I presented to them, commissioned me to write an article, uh, an investigative piece on the murder. They covered some expenses, and they paid me a fee, and I went to work on it. And uh, it, was, it was a longer journey than what I expected because I was working on the article on and off over a two-year process. At the end of the two-year process, the New York Times Magazine uh, killed the story. And the reason given, basically, is do we really want to you know, do we really want to say these negative things and these, some of the, dark, the darker things that I had uncovered in the story? At the same time that I was talking to the New York Times Magazine, I was also talking uh, with, well, around the same time that my story was killed at the Times Magazine, I was also talking with ABC News 2020. What I had in, originally hoped is that at the time the Times Magazine story ran, that maybe there could be a television piece as well. So I thought, when the Times Magazine story got killed, that was the end of any possibility of having it, you know, having it uh, produced at ABC News. But, in fact, the executive producer of 2020, who still works at ABC News, David Sloan, who's also gay, um, based on the unpublished article and the material I put in front of him, said, no, let's do this, and we'll give it an hour. So, over the next seven months, I worked with a producing colleague by the name of Glenn Silver, who was the staff producer at ABC News. We continued to report the story, went back to Wyoming, traveled to several other states, and began interviewing people. And that story aired in November of 2004. When the story aired, there were some avenues in the research and investigation that there, the story for ABC News was generating controversy even before it went on the air. The network was hearing from people saying, you know, why are you doing this story? You know, uh, some activist groups saying, can we come in and see the edited cut before you put it on the air, etc. But anyway, the, the, the finished piece, there were some things we had discovered that did not make it into the final piece. To Glenn Silver and myself, they were things that were very credible, but they were left out of the story. What we essentially suggested in the story was that it appeared that Aaron McKinney and Matthew Shepard had known each other, and that they had probably known each other through uh, social circles in Laramie, some of which centered around the drug with crystal meth. Uh, but that's as far as we went in the piece. We did also have a couple of people in the story who suggested that Aaron McKinney was bisexual and that Aaron McKinney had been involved with guys substantiating what I had found initially in the anonymous letter. So the piece aired, and I, after the piece aired, I went on, I was working on a few other projects, but I was really haunted because I wanted to continue reporting the story, which I ultimately did. Went back to old sources, found new sources, and really advanced the reporting to, uh, to a new place. And that is really the book, the book of Matt which uh, really, in many ways, picks, off, uh, picks up where the ABC News piece left off. There are some redundancies because I'm going through a reconstruction of what was going on in the weeks and days and hours before the crime took place. So there are some places where there are some redundancies, but there are also a number of new sources, and a lot more is said in the book. So that's sort of the, um, 
the general background of how I came to write the book. But what I'd like to do, just as a refresher, um, I know that Matthew Shepard, um, that Matthew Shepard died, you know, uh, a long, well, it's 15 years ago now, and some of you may not remember the details vividly, but what I'd like to do at the beginning of the book, I just uh, quote from a couple of uh, leading uh, news sources, and uh, I'll just read you a couple of the pieces, so just, just for the sake of remembering how the crime was perceived at the time. And this is from chapter one, which is called Father and Son. From the very first reports of the October 6th, 1998 attack, major news organizations provided a generally uniform account of the crime and the motives behind it. A sampling of newspaper and magazine stories painted a harrowing picture. This is the Boston Globe. Shepard, 22, a first year student at the University of Wyoming, paid dearly, allegedly for trusting two strangers enough at the fireside lounge to tell them he is gay. What followed was an atrocity that forced the stunned community of Laramie to painfully confront the festering evil of anti-gay hatred as the nation and its lawmakers watched. This is the Denver Post. Police investigators turned up the following sequence of alleged events. Sometime Tuesday night, Shepard met Henderson and McKinney while at the fireside bar at, while at the fireside bar and lounge. Shepard told them he was gay. They invited him to leave with them. All three got into McKinney's father's pickup, and the attack began. Newsweek. Hungry for cash, perhaps riled by Shepard's trusting admission that he was gay, they drove to the edge of town, police say, pistol whipped him until his skull collapsed, and then left him tied like a fallen scarecrow or a savior to the bottom of a cross-hatched fence. The Washington Post. Albany County Sheriff Gary Poles, who suggested that the beating was being investigated as a hate crime, said, the investigation is aggressively continuing. Laramie Police Commander Dave O'Malley told the Associated Press that while robbery was the main motive, Shepard was targeted because he was gay. Time Magazine. What people mean when they say Matthew Shepard's murder was a lynching is that he was killed to make a point. So he was stretched along a Wyoming fence, not just as a dying young man, but as a signpost. When push comes to shove, it says, this is what we have in mind for gays. And finally, the New York Times. While some gay leaders saw crucifixion imagery in Mr. Shepard's death, others saw a different symbolism, the Old West practice of nailing a dead coyote to a ranch fence as a warning to future intruders. So let me just summarize a little bit about what I found over the course of a very long investigation. Is that Matthew Shepard and Aaron McKinney did indeed know each other, that they had been friends for months before this crime took place. And they were not only friends, but they bought and sold drugs from each other. They bought, and, they bought and sold methamphetamine from each other. By way of background, Aaron McKinney had been dealing meth for three years prior to this crime happening. He was also a methamphetamine addict. And in the book, I trace day by day in the week prior to the crime, with using a number of named sources, people that testified in the trial, that Aaron McKinney was using meth uh, every day up until the morning of the attack on Shepard. That uh, I was able to trace also with named sources different contexts in which Aaron and Matthew had known each other. Uh, over the course of the investigation, I found no evidence that Russell Henderson, the accomplice, had ever met Matthew Shepard before. In fact, Russell Henderson and Aaron McKinney became friends uh, early in the summer of 1998. Uh, Aaron McKinney had gotten out of jail in Laramie because uh, he had uh, 
committed the previous year a burglary of a, of a KFC uh, locally. And after, after burglarizing the KFC, he fled to Florida for several months where he was living with his girlfriend. She was pregnant. At the time of the attack on Matthew, the baby had been born. The, baby, the, the son was about four months old. But Russell Henderson, when Aaron McKinney got out of jail, uh, Aaron McKinney's half-brother introduced, uh, uh, Russell Henderson's half-brother introduced him to Aaron McKinney. Aaron McKinney was looking for a job, and Russell Henderson was working as a roofer then, and he helped, he helped uh, Aaron McKinney get a job working for the roofing company. In fact, Matthew Shepard and Aaron McKinney had, had been friends and knew each other longer than Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson, the two perpetrators. As I began to really look at what the relationship, uh, and this was a lot of it after I did the 2020 piece, really looked at what the relationship involved. One of the new sources that I introduced in the book was a longtime friend of Matthew. He had met Matthew when Matthew was a teenager, uh, and they had a lover relationship for a period of time, but he had never given an interview before, had never spoken. I was trying to get him to, to talk for the ABC News piece, but he was very, still very frightened and there was kind of some pressure being brought to bear on him not to talk. But he did talk for the book. And he spoke uh, at length about what he knew about Aaron McKinney's relationship with Matthew. Uh, as I started to look uh, into some of Matthew's activities, and again, I just want to say, again, this was a horrible murder. Uh, it was you know, as I said earlier, grotesquely violent. And there's nothing that I can say or explain to you about the circumstances around the crime that take away from that. Nor am I talking about this because I want to take something away from many of the gay rights advances that have happened since this crime took place. But Matthew was someone who he had, he had struggled with various drug issues since he was around 15 years old. And the year, in 1997, while he was living in Denver, he moved again uh, to Laramie in the summer of 1988, he got involved with kind of a rough bunch of people that were involved with uh, selling methamphetamine. They transported it from Denver. Uh, usually what happened is Fort Collins is roughly midway between Denver and Laramie. Um, they would distribute some in Fort Collins and then bring it on to Laramie. And with, with some of this group of people in Denver, a couple of them had grown up in Laramie, and they still had families there, and they commuted back and forth. Matthew himself spent a good deal of time in Laramie during the year he was living in Denver, before he moved, before he left Denver and moved to Laramie. But the group of people that Matthew kind of fell in with in, in uh, Denver, uh, after Matthew was killed, Several of them uh, ended up serving prison time for a variety of offenses, including the interstate trafficking of methamphetamine. And in the book, again, I use some of the court documents uh, and, and information from some of, some of these other cases. So you had Matthew connected to this Denver group, and Aaron McKinney in Laramie, who was connected with a, a, a Laramie uh, a Laramie-based group of drug suppliers, okay? And methamphetamine, just to give you a little background so this doesn't seem like some isolated, freakish thing. By 1998, when this crime happened, Wyoming was already in the throes of a major methamphetamine epidemic. Um, the, the national media did not really start to report on the meth epidemic that was going on in parts of, uh, in parts of uh, the, uh, mid you know, the Midwest as well as Western states until roughly 2000, between 2004 and 2007 is when the national media started to give attention to that story. At the very same time that meth was moving through those parts of the country, largely rural or small town areas, it was also becoming an epidemic in certain urban gay communities. It started initially with San Francisco, Los Angeles, and New York, but it also moved to other areas and spread pretty widely. It was already a problem in Denver in 1997 when this crime happened. In the years right before 
the attack on Matthew, and the years that followed, and even continuing on to today. Um, Wyoming has uh, one of the highest per capita uh, you, you know, meth rates in the country. Um, there have been years uh, since Matthew was killed where up to 70-75% of crimes in the state of Wyoming have directly been attributed to methamphetamine. So this, you know, what I'm saying about what happened in the Shepherd murder is not an isolated, isolated incident. This had become a very, very serious problem. And what's interesting is that it took a TV series like Breaking Bad, which was on the air for five years, for the American public to begin to get a sense, really, unless you read, you know, unless you read a lot of news, to really get a sense of what methamphetamine is about and what it's doing. And um, so that's just you know a little bit, uh, a little bit about what I found out. So the, you know what the major news organizations were saying when all of this happened. Okay, this was the, the basic story was two you know homophobic rednecks walked into a bar and decided to target Matthew because he was gay. In the book, I trace and deconstruct the different versions of that story that developed in the days right after the crime and how it kept getting elaborated and on and embellished. For example, the, uh, Aaron McKinney's girlfriend, her name was Kristen Price. Kristen Price, within a few days of the attack, went on national television and her version was that Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson were in the bar and that Matthew Shepard in the bar made a sexual advance on them, and that they decided to take him out and beat him up to teach him a lesson not to come on to straight people, okay? That story contradicts what the prosecutor would later argue before a jury in McKinney's case, which is that really it was, they walked into the bar and his theory was, because he looked well-dressed and appeared to be small, they decided to, they decided to focus on him as a victim and decided to rob him for that reason. By the time of McKinney's trial, a year after the crime, Aaron McKinney now had a different version, and that version was not that Matthew Shepard had come on to them in the bar, but that after Matthew Shepard left the bar and got into a truck with Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson, they drove through town, and when they got to the far end of town on Grand Avenue, that Matthew Shepard reached over and grabbed Aaron McKinney's leg, and it was that that caused him to explode in violence. Uh, Aaron McKinney, Russell Henderson, and the girlfriends, Kristen Price and Chastity Pesley, all admitted to me in interviews, long interviews over, you know, many of them recorded over a long period of time, that this was an alibi that they had kind of come up with beginning with Aaron McKinney arriving home on the night of the crime and he's bloody and tells his girlfriend you know that a gay guy came into him in the bar came on to him in the bar and that story continued to get embellished and as the media began to embellish it then Kristen Price is then picking up on the media and she's embellished for all of them have acknowledged to me Aaron McKinney has acknowledged that what he was really looking for that night was uh, a, you know, a stash of six ounces of methamphetamine, which had a street value of about ten to twelve thousand uh, dollars. Aaron McKinney owed, uh, you know, a couple of his drug suppliers money. He was always getting advanced drugs, and after he sold them, he was supposed to go pay the suppliers, and he wasn't doing that, and he, he fell behind. This was the beginning of this was October sixth, the night of the crime. He hadn't paid his rent for October. He had a live-in girlfriend at home and a four-month-old son. So he was in a very, very desperate place. But Aaron McKinney acknowledged that he was planning to rob Matthew Shepard that night, that what he was really looking for were the six ounces of methamphetamine, which he viewed as a solution to his problems. Uh, Kristen Price acknowledged that she had lied because she would have done anything to try to protect Aaron or try to get, get, you know, get him out of jail. And Chastity Pasley and Russell Henderson have also acknowledged that they, went along, that they went along with the story. And I want to just read you a brief excerpt. It's just a paragraph here. But um, again, 
when documents are sealed, okay, and they were sealed for, for more than a year, journalists can't look at this information and study it and research it and examine it and go out and talk to witnesses. But here is a letter. Uh, this is, I'll, I'll read a line of introduction. Uh, I re-examined a letter Aaron had smuggled to Russell in jail after their arrest, advising him of a scenario they should use to explain the attack. And this was a handwritten letter from Aaron McKinney to Russell. Hey, homeboy, when we go to court, if they try us together or separate, they should hear you say what I said. So this is what I told them. Me and you was getting fucked up at the bar, and when we was fixing to leave, Matt Shepard asked us for a ride home. So we gave him a ride. And when we got out there, he tried to get on me, and I started kicking his ass. At no time did, did we know he was gay until he tried to get on me. The reason Matt told us he lived in Imperial Heights is because he wanted to get me in a dark place so we could get funky. That's all. That's all I got for now. I'm sure I'll think of more later. So again, here it is. Aaron McKinney's adding something else, which is that Matthew Shepard asked him for a ride home. Okay. So these were some of the uh, some of the inconsistencies, the questions, the complexities. When I was researching this, and I started to look at at the documents and started to see that there were things that had been completely left out of the, of the public narrative. Uh, one of the things I talk about in the book, uh, one of the police officers in the case, is that soon after this crime happened, he interviewed one of Matthew's uh, closest friends. His name is Alex Trout. And in, right there in the police report, Alex Trout, in fact, it's in two police reports, Alex Trout told two police officers that when Matthew was living in Denver, he had gotten involved with, with cocaine and methamphetamine. And yet, this is somehow also was eliminated from the public narrative. Um, I, I, I think there's one other fact that probably you've never come across, which is that um, Aaron McKinney attacked four males in a 24-hour period of which Matthew Shepard was one, and obviously the most severe. The night before the crime, on Monday night, Aaron McKinney broke into uh, his cousin's home in Laramie. It was the early morning hours, and he was looking for a guy who he had previously beaten up. Aaron claimed this fellow by the name of Monty owed him drugs. And so Aaron McKinney broke in and lunged at this guy, and other people in Laramie had seen Aaron beat this guy up before. He lunged at this guy, and the other people pulled him off, uh, pulled him off Monty. Matthew Shepard, obviously, by far the most severe, and, and you know, it was a fatal beating, but in the course of beating Matthew Shepard when they were out on the prairie, Russell Henderson, the accomplice, tried to stop Aaron McKinney, and when he tried to stop Aaron McKinney, Aaron McKinney took the murder weapon, the bloody gun, the 357 Magnum, struck Russell Henderson across the face, and Russell Henderson got nine stitches later that night in a hospital emergency room. This, uh, the person that first told me about this was the prosecutor, Cal Ruka, because in his investigation he had noticed that the wound on Russell Henderson's face, it resembled the same shape as many of the wounds found on Matthew Shepard's body. It had a half moon shape. After leaving Matthew tied to the fence, literally minutes later, Aaron and Russell left the scene. They drove to a residential area in downtown Laramie, parked the truck, and they got into a fight, a scuffle with these two young Hispanic men. And Aaron McKinney once again went to the truck, got the murder weapon, came, and struck one of the Hispanic guys across the head. And the guy had a, you know, a wound that covered the whole top part of his skull, and he was treated in the emergency room that night. So again, when you talk about uh, when you talk about this crime as a pure, uh, clear-cut case of anti-gay hate, then one of the one of the lingering questions, obviously, is what about the other three males that Aaron McKinney, the other three straight males that Aaron McKinney 
assaulted that night. So that's just a little bit, kind of a summary of what um, you know. Some of the things, some of the things I uncovered. The work took me um, doing some undercover work, you know, uh, with meth dealers, um, both in Wyoming and Colorado. Um, I learned a lot about meth and uh, not just. Uh, the epidemic of use, but um, you know the chemical aspects, what methamphetamine can do with long-term use. In McKinney's case, using it for three years, Matt also used meth on a regular basis. But uh, I learned about meth, you know, meth-induced psychosis, the hallucinations, the uh, the way in which methamphetamine, with prolonged use, affects brain chemistry. So those are some of the general things. And what I'd like to do is sort of open this up to some questions and discussion, and then if we have time, I might read another short passage or two, depending on what your interest is here in the story, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I know that there are a few people here who have been involved with productions of the Laramie Project, which I'm very familiar with, and would be happy to uh, answer any questions. Yes. I have a question. Sure. Um, thank you for your talk. It was very informative and, and really interesting. Um, I just, I, it's a lot of your information. Obviously, the story that I'm familiar with is the one that um, is much more um, publicly popular. popular. Um, but the, the, the idea of this being a hate crime um, is something that really, you know, sticks with me. And uh, and I'm just wondering that, you know, you said earlier you don't want to say, you know, you're not um, trying to go back on any of the accomplishments that have come for gay rights from this incident. But uh, doesn't a lot of this have to do with the fact that because part of their own defense, Aaron McKinley and, and Russell uh, Henderson. Henderson, part of what their defense was was saying, well, we attacked him because he was gay. So didn't they kind of bring that on themselves, the fact that this whole thing became a hate crime? Because it wasn't just Matthew's family saying this, but they were using that as a defense yeah. as well. Okay, well, first of all, let me distinguish between Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson. Russell Henderson has never stated anywhere that he, was, that he had any kind of homophobic motive for attacking Matthew. What he has always acknowledged is that when they left the bar, he knew that Aaron McKinney was going to had intended to rob Matthew, but he did, there's nothing in the record in a confession. Russell Henderson didn't have a trial, okay? So uh, the statements we can go by are statements that he gave after he accepted a plea bargain and was convicted and sentenced. Uh, the one time he was questioned by police, as they started to talk with him, he actually stopped and said, I don't want to talk anymore without a lawyer being here. So there is nothing in the record that shows any homophobic or hate crime motive on Russell Henderson's part. Now, on Aaron McKinney's, yes, there are these different versions that I've read. You know, Matthew asked us for a ride home. You know, Matthew made a sexual advance on me. Matthew did these things. But I will also say, let's just take a step back. The crime happened on a Tuesday night. Matthew was found 18 hours later early on Wednesday evening, okay, he was taken to a hospital in Fort Collins. Aaron McKinney was not, uh, did not give a statement to police until Friday morning. In the meantime, two friends of Matthew, by the name of uh, Alex Trout, I mentioned earlier, and Walt Bolden. Walt uh, was a teacher at the University of Wyoming. <coughs> Alex had been, also been a longtime friend of Matt, but he was closer in age to Matt. They learned of the crime because Dennis Shepard, Matthew's father, called Walt Bolden from Saudi Arabia to tell him the news that Matthew had been severely beaten. And since it was going to take a, a long period of time for the Shepherds, the family, mom and dad, to get back from Saudi Arabia, Walt Bolden and Alex Trout went to the hospital where Matthew was in Fort Collins, Colorado. And as soon as they got to the hospital, okay, they began calling gay organizations in Wyoming and Colorado, and also called the media, saying 
that Matthew had been attacked because he was gay. They had no direct knowledge of the crime. They claimed, or one of them claimed, that in the hospital he heard a police officer made an offhanded remark that maybe, some, maybe this had something to do with Matthew being gay. I have not been able to find the police officer that made that remark. But in any case, before McKinney ever came up with his gay panic story, before any of that happened, these calls were made and it got picked up by Associated Press and it, it spread across the country very, very, very quickly. And so Aaron McKinney's gay panic story, okay, he, he was claiming that, you know, this ridiculous thing that Matthew grabbed him, but that story continued to be embellished over time and was embellished alongside the media myth that quickly took hold. Yes? Um, I was, you briefly touched on it at the end of your talk. Um, I was wondering what the effects, if you know, of meth would specifically have on the brain that may have led to crime like this or yeah. anything you know about that. Well, um, for one thing, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Again, it depends on how much you're using, but with prolonged use, and I quote in the book from uh, one of really the leading meth experts in the world at UCLA Medical Center, Dr. Rick Rawson, he talks about with prolonged use, early on, okay, you know, you're having hallucinations. I describe some of McKinney's experiences of, you know, uh, you know, seeing people melting and, you know, hallucinations. But what happens over time is increased paranoia, a lot of restlessness, um, and, and psychotic behavior. Uh, some of, you know, crimes involving meth are some of the most horrifically violent crimes in the sense that people will do things that under ordinary circumstances they would never do. Also, you have cases of, for example, a mother or a father having a young child, and they're really involved with meth, they're addicted to meth, or they're selling meth, and they'll leave a kid alone in a house for days uh, without caring for them, feeding them. So, you know, the term that's used most frequently now is meth psychosis. Some people refer to meth rage. But it literally directly affects the brain chemistry. And um, so it's something that's very, very hard to treat. I can tell you uh, that I was in Laramie uh, last Tuesday because I did a book event there. And it was my first time. I traveled all around the country. And the last part of my tour was in Laramie. And there was a source of mine in the book that um, had really helped me a lot. And she had known Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson growing up. Um, but, you know, her home is in a mobile home park. And I had sent her a text. I had called her. And the, her phone had been disconnected. So I was with a friend. And I just decided to drive over to the mobile home park. So I got there and knocked on her door. She came to the door. This woman, it, it made me realize uh, how 15 years later, how serious this problem still is. Uh, this woman has one son, who grew, same age group as Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson, um, who is now, I don't know, about 33 years old. He has been in and out of prison for meth dealing and meth use since he was 18 years old. That son just got out of prison, okay? I know that her daughter was having problems with this a couple of years ago, and now her son, uh, who recently had, you know, has two young kids, has twins, her son uh, has just been sentenced on federal meth charges and uh, got a five-year prison sentence. This is just one family, and in that town, Albany County, Wyoming, where Laramie sits, uh, at the time of the Shepherd crime, it, it's the poorest county in Wyoming, and, um, you know, like many places where the meth epidemic hit in Iowa, Missouri, Nebraska, Kansas, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, it hit places often that were already a little bit economically depressed. And uh, people turned to it as a source not just to feed their habit, but even as a livelihood. The, there's a great book that was written called Methland that uh, came out, oh, I don't know, maybe about four years ago that really talks about the meth epidemic in that part of the Midwest, Iowa, and surrounding states, that I think is really terrific. I think it's probably the best thing that's been written on the meth epidemic. Thank you. Yes? I was wondering what your hopes
tools for, for, for writing this book and bring some of these things to light because it certainly can't be denied that there have been a lot of advances in hate crime legislation and other areas of advocacy around the story. And certainly, kind of bringing these facts up won't discount that or take that away. No, so no. I'm just curious about what your hopes and being yeah. to light more than explaining what, what is seemingly or ostensibly the truth. Sure. Um, I've been interested in my work for a long time in violence in its many manifestations. I've also been interested in uh, law and justice and crime. So I've done a number of crime stories in the past. And in this particular case, I, I, I'll tell you, um, there was something early on that was, you know, when I say early on, I mean seven, eight years ago, that was even 10 years ago, that was driving me, which I'll tell you about. Um, I mentioned earlier that I came out in the 1970s. I've been involved with a lot of gay rights issues over the years. And in the uh, mid-1980s, when the AIDS epidemic first hit, and of course, it's so different than now, because you know, HIV and AIDS right now are, you know, it's very treatable, okay? But at that time, it was, it was pretty much like getting a death sentence. You would be sick for a matter of months. And, in the mid to late 1980s, I probably lost 75% of my gay male friends in New York City. And so there was a certain kind of a trauma that came from living through that period. And later on, when I got involved working on the Shepherd story, when I started to learn about what meth was and started to see what meth was doing in certain areas of the gay community, I would, you know, I was frightened, I was alarmed, but then also realized there were studies being done that were showing that um, there were higher rates of HIV transmission among people that were using and abusing crystal meth. Because when you're on the drug in the early stages, you feel like you're 100 feet tall and, you know, <laughs> not, nothing, can, nothing can hurt you. So people were having unprotected sex and spreading HIV that way. So there was something there that that was one of those trigger moments for me where I said, I've got to do something about this. I've got to write something about this. This is another epidemic coming on the heels of the AIDS epidemic. But as far as gay rights, here's, here's what I think. I think the, the movement has really matured. I think that the uh, clock is not going to be set back on gay rights because of what we learn about one case. And I think and I would say this about uh, other cases and other stories beyond the Matthew Shepard tragedy. It's easier, okay? It, to me, it's an easy way out to look at, to see something that is simple, a black and white story, and latch on to that. Yes, we can all feel sad about what happened to Matthew, what happened to his family. But to me, it requires more courage, to look at the complexities of this crime and to understand what really brought about this kind of violence. I mean, Ken gave a little bit of an introduction talking about hate and hatred. I distinguish, when I'm talking, between what the legal meaning of hate crime is, according to the law that now bears Matthew's name. What does that mean legally and technically when you go into a courtroom and you put a case before a jury or you're arguing based on the law? That is one thing. Hatred is something else. Hatred exists in many forms, and violence exists in many forms. And my interest as a writer is looking at what caused this horrifically violent crime to happen. And the answer I've come up with is there's a multiplicity of reasons and a multiplicity of things that came into play here. Uh, and that, to me, it behooves us to understand those complexities and to understand what was really driving the events around Matthew's murder, if we're serious about trying to stop events, stop events from like from this like like this from happening. In the back. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk about the Matthew Shepard story and the reception of the 60 Minutes um, television program and kind of about just how like the national public has reacted to this really being an issue of drug, like a drug issue and around crystal meth and how 
that has been like recepted and just kind of shift the focus to like this issue that is a big issue that is not hasn't traditionally been addressed in the context of this case. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, as I mentioned earlier, when I was doing the ABC News story, there was a lot of concern before the piece aired about what the content of it would be because of the nature of the questioning we were doing, etc. Once the piece aired, there was once after the piece aired, there were some responses from activists, you know, saying basically, you know, how can you question that this was an anti-gay hate crime? This is outrageous. But in truth, uh, journalists, my colleagues, in you know, in the national media, there was no serious questioning of the findings of the ABC News 2020 piece. Um, when I say activists, I believe at the time it was GLAAD, the human rights campaign, uh, that, that essentially was saying somehow they were trying to discredit what the reporting was. The 2020 piece went on to win major journalism awards, one from the Northwestern University School of Journalism, the Writers Guild of America Award, and others. So that reporting was never discredited, despite rumors flying around on the, you know, on the internet that it was. Um, the book has been interesting because, again, there was a parallel phenomenon, which is that before the book was published, there were some people that were reacting to the idea of the book. And in the first few weeks after publication, it was really clear that there were people writing things on the internet, reacting to the idea of the book, and not having read the book itself. As time has passed over the last uh, over four months, what we've noticed is that the be it was almost as if people were afraid to step out. At the beginning when the book came out, there were um, you know, three very well-respected gay journalists who came out and spoke positively about the book. One was Aaron Hicklin, the editor of The Advocate. One of the others was Andrew Sullivan. But what's happened over time, over the last four months, is that more and more gay journalists who have taken time to read the book have been talking about why the book is important. But this has been over time. Uh, you know, that's, that's what I can tell you. As far as the media reaction, there's, there's one, there are one or two organizations online uh, who have been very critical of the book. Uh, I think they've written six or seven pieces about it. But if you actually look at the pieces, you'll see that they're not, uh, they're not questioning any specific pieces of reporting in the book or offering contrary information. Again, it's the idea of the book because this was such a seminal event. I'm saying, yes, it was a seminal event. And of course, the cause of gay rights is a just one. And that cause is not going to, going to be diminished because we understand more of the human complexities of Matthew's murder. You know, certainly Matthew's memory deserves to have those complexities be part of the record. He suffered from a number of things. And, you know, even in the Laramie Project, Matthew is missing as a character. Most of those initial news reports, no one would say very much about Matthew. It was the same set of facts repeated over and over. Matthew went to boarding school in Switzerland. Matthew was small. Matthew liked, was interested in international human rights. It was the same set of facts, but who he was as a person? It was conspicuously absent from the public narrative. Um, has uh, Moses Kaufman responded to the book? Uh, yes, but it was two words. He said it was bad journalism. So you really haven't spoken to him? I haven't that. spoken with Moises. And um, uh, what I can tell you is something that I've reported in the book, which is that there were two people that uh, are part of the Laramie Project, two real people from Laramie, Sh Shannon Shingleton and Jenny Malmscott. Both of them uh, knew Matthew Shepard, they were friends with Matthew, and they were also friends with Aaron McKinney. And in the book, I talk about the fact that back in 1998-99, soon after this happened, when the Laramie Project creators were in Laramie, they interviewed Jenny and Shannon extensively. And they told the creators of the Laramie Project that Aaron and Matthew were part of the same Laramie party circles that included Matt. It was left out of the Laramie project. 
And uh, I've also uh, spoken uh, at length with Steve Belber, one of the four writers of the Laramie Project, and also a journalist a friend who also reported the story, Joanne Vipajeski. Inside the creation of that play, there was dispute among the four writers about what they were going to say and not say. There were some people, including Steve Belber, who really wanted to say more about some of the things they knew. And um, there, was, there was dispute there. And creatively, I suppose, Moises, I wasn't there, so I can't say, but I'm assuming Moises, as the artistic director of the Tectonic, had the ultimate responsibility for how the piece was shaped. Yeah. Yes. Um, I was wondering, do you think if the narrative had been different, if, if they had actually spoken about um, the problems of meth and poverty in, in these areas, the relationship between that and how that played into the crime, it would have garnered as much public attention? Or if this, does the public want an easy narrative to do it? Something well, you know, it's a, that's a really tough question. Because to what extent is it that the public wants that narrative? And to what extent is it also the media that wants to give us a tabloid narrative? And as I read to you, you know, uh, I have to say that there is, uh, there's even bigotry there in the portrait of what, what, what the Wyoming landscape is. I mean, the fence where this happened was portrayed in many articles as being this remote ranch fence you know, out there in the middle of nowhere. It's actually, it wasn't even a real, it, it was a log fence that was actually decorative that was close to a new suburban development going out on the edges of Laramie where they were putting up new houses. But it was made to seem like this bleak ranch fence where there was real cat, you know, and it wasn't that at all. And in Time, in Time Magazine's coverage in one paragraph, I found six factual errors in one paragraph, okay? McKinney and Henderson were described as tall, muscular men. Matthew was described as being crucified to the fence, hanging on the fence like this. That never happened. His mother has been on the record about this for a very long time. That didn't prevent Vanity Fair from publishing a story called The Crucifixion of Matthew Shepard, and many others. Uh, I remember seeing an illustration in the Philadelphia Inquirer that showed a man hanging on a fence like a scarecrow. So, there were many, many embellishments. So do I think the public has an appetite for simplistic things? Sometimes, yes. But I think the media also has an appetite for writing stories that way. And when they don't have facts, filling them out um, in, in dramatic ways. And that's certainly, in part, what happened here. Uh, going back to the initial introduction of the changing narrative. Uh, and this is clearly a pointed case of a changing narrative. You go with one set of ideas and you develop over many years a change. Uh, does it require cross-validation? That is to look into some other venue and show uh, as an advanced change of narrative as you find here. Do you know of other instances of other... Are you saying specifically with regarding crime or could it be any other type of... Any other. Okay, well I'll just give, I mean, this is one example that has stayed with me. Um, the narrative about weapons of mass destruction. Ah, really. uh -huh. okay. The uh, I mentioned this because when I I got this award for the Shepherd piece, and the same year, Michael Massing, who wrote extensively about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq for the New York Review of Books, we were getting an award at the same time, and I found it fascinating. It was for correcting misleading or inaccurate stories. Look at how our understanding of that story has evolved over time. Initially, everyone, including people in the government, but certainly the national media, is this is what the story is and this is the justification for the war. And over time, we've certainly come to understand that very differently. So that maybe your next book should really be about the generalization huh. of cross narratives of changing of the yeah. narratives. That's the 
booked and rushed. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it looks like. So, just on that analogy, yeah. I think it's pretty clear there were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Right. What, what's your take on the role that being gay ultimately played in Matthew Shepard's murder? The To me, the most complicated factor, and I think it's really hard to get into someone's head, is that Aaron McKinney was, was closeted bisexual, okay? And he was closeted to his girlfriend, he was closeted to his family, and he was closeted to most of his friends. But he did engage in gay activity, not just in Denver, but also in Laramie. And I have, you know, in the book I talk about several instances where he had been witnessed by law enforcement, people that were, you know, Aaron McKinney had had bisexual gay sex in the company of other people, okay? It was not that this was something that he was really hiding. Um, so clearly, if he was not out, okay, if people didn't know that, there, he was struggling with something there. I can't get in his, inside his head to tell you exactly what that was, but I think like if you look back at Brokeback Mountain, there's something really interesting in Brokeback Mountain because you see how, how those two characters are struggling with the homophobia around them, but they're also struggling with the homophobia in themselves, all right? As far as the motives for the crime that night, okay, that aspect in terms of Aaron McKinney's explosion in violence, there's nothing I have found, including this story about Matthew grabbing him, that has any validity. I mean, Aaron McKinney, and, and this is, you know, the law, a couple of the law enforcement people, the key people, prosecutor and one of the homicide detectives who took McKinney's confession, saying this was about drugs and money. Aaron McKinney was after drugs and money. He wasn't, this was not, because he did not track Matthew Shepard from bar to bar that night and pick him up and take him in the car because he wanted to kill a gay guy, okay? He took him out because he was trying to get drugs and money. So, you know, I could speculate about some of those, you know, some of those unresolved issues that McKinney had, but that's all it would be is speculation because I have nothing that gives me, you know, I mean, McKinney has lied about knowing Matthew Shepard, but there are enough people that have placed him in enough situations together, including a lover of Matthew. But if you notice in the passage I read, when McKinney writes the letter to the jailhouse letter to Russell Henderson, he calls him Matt Shepard. No one knew him, only his friends and family called him Matt. To the rest of the world, he was Matthew Shepard. Why is Aaron McKinney calling him Matt Shepard? I mean, so, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to, to avoid the question, but it's a complicated question of psychology, and that's certainly not the basis of the convict, you know, of the trial here, which was felony murder. But what you are raising gets into some of the areas around hate crime and trying to get inside what is going on in someone's head, what their motive is. And it's a very difficult question, especially when you have something like methamphetamine, where the experts will tell you, you cannot logically conclude what was going on in someone's mind when they're on this drug because their behavior is completely, you know, crazy. So, the, so the, the mul earlier you used this phrase, multiplicity of factors. Yeah. Like so you want to leave the door open for uh, a hate crime motivation, but you don't have evidence for it? Or what I, what I would say is this, I, I think again, hate crime, which now has a legal meaning, I'd rather say, I know there are certain criteria, but again, it's based on the arguments that lawyers present in court, there's a judge, there's a jury, for them to decide, does something qualify as a hate crime? But, but in a casual meaning, let's not be lawyers. Well, I would say um, that could hatred have been a factor here? How could, you, how could you commit a crime like this where hatred in emotion is not present, but hatred in emotion is present in many different crimes? That's different than hate crime. So I would also say, when I mentioned a multiplicity of factors, there were, there were some class issues here. Okay, here's Matthew. He did go to boarding school in Switzerland. He can, the Friday night before this happened, he spent $1,100 in cash 
going out in a limousine that night in Laramie, Wyoming, as a college student, a stretch limousine, to go down to a disco in Fort Collins. He took a whole bunch of friends out and bought them breakfast at Denny's. Matthew spent a lot of money, okay? Aaron McKinney was working as a roofer and was living hand to mouth. Do I think the class issue played in? Absolutely. He knew, he, he knew that Matthew could afford to do a lot of things that he couldn't do. Aaron McKinney had money and he blew through it very quickly. He sort of, his, um, you know, the people that he looked up to were kind of the really flashy uh, rap stars. You know, really thick gold chains. He had a big thick gold chain that said Dopey. He had a vanity license plate that said Dopey. Um, he, you know, he, he got a, an insurance settlement because his mother died of a botched hysterectomy. He had $100,000. He blew through it so quickly. Drugs, limousine rides, giving friends money, buying them presents, buying himself jewelry. And, you know, he had that, that's kind of what his ideal was, like the gangster. I know you've been trying to ask a question. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, I was just wondering if this sparked any interest for you in the mass epidemic, and if so, if you could speak a little bit about what you think is being done right now and what the hopes of yeah. it are. Well, there's been actually a lot of progress that has been made, and the progress really started, as I said earlier, roughly between 2004 and 7 is when the national media started reporting on it, and it led to uh, education campaigns. What you, ha what you found, e even with the prosecutor in my book, who initially was very tough, law and order, you know, give these guys the biggest sentence, he started to shift more toward a treatment approach. And as soon as the education campaign started, it was really interesting, because much like the epidemic itself, I remember driving into Laramie when the first big billboard started to appear outside town, okay, with before and after. You'd see the picture of the person, you know, looking before they ever touched meth and then after, you know, really looking bad. And around the same time, that's when the first posters started to show up in Chelsea in New York and the Castro in San Francisco is talk about the crystal meth epidemic. And it was starting to, ha it was starting, so that education campaign has done a lot. It's still a big problem uh, in certain states, including Wyoming, which still has the highest per capita rates, but I'm sure some of you have read, I think there was an article either today or yesterday in the New York Times about a small town. There is a new heroin epidemic, which in some places has a direct relationship to the meth epidemic, because what happened is people that had been up for long periods of time on meth, where it was keeping them really wired, they couldn't sleep, all the restlessness, began to turn to heroin to start to bring them down, and we're now looking at a new heroin epidemic too. I'm gonna ask the, I guess the last question because we're running out of sure, time. Sure, sure. Um, you talk to a lot of people um, who probably didn't want to talk to you, yeah. who didn't want to change their story. And I imagine at some point you didn't want to change your story, although I, I'm not sure I want, it'd be nice to hear how hard or easy it was for you to come to this um, shift in your views. But one of the things that it's clear is that for a lot of people it's a lot of courage to speak up and, and to go on record. And for a lot of people you talk to did. They, they stuck to their story, and you suspect that some of them know that they're sticking to stories that they think oh, yeah. are not fully true. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, and this is totally outside of what you've talked about, okay. but to what extent can you come up with some characteristics of the difference between the people who let truth, you know, in a sense, had the courage to sort of say, we were all wrong, or right. we were living in a lie, and versus the people who are insisting that if we keep the we keep the lie or we keep the myth because the myth is more important than reality. We, have you been able to? And I don't know if you, maybe this is not something you've reflected upon, but if it is, is there some shift or some difference or some characteristics that you're finding? Yeah. Um, well, um, actually, I mean, I I can't make any big conclusions, but I can just share a few observations that I've had. Um, in the case of a couple of the law enforcement officers who have been really clinging to this story about, you know, the, what I call the hate crime narrative, is that there are two cops in Laramie. One is the sheriff now and one is the undersheriff. And they have acknowledged publicly that up until the Shepard murder, 
they used to tell anti-gay jokes and make homophobic slurs and everything. So to me, and, and they've told the story of their personal transformation, how this case led to an awakening in them. I know that in the case of one of those cops, that he actually really tried to persuade the prosecutor not to tell the truth to ABC News, and his argument was because of the good that has been done in Matthew Shepard's name. Okay, now, you know, I'm glad that he had that personal awakening, but um, I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to sit back and have a cop who used to tell, tell anti-gay jokes lecture to me um, about, as a gay man about what is good for the gay community. So, you know, there are cops then, but there have been some public servants, law enforcement officers, the prosecutor, who have been remarkably courageous. Because in the original case, the prosecutor worked to keep mention of methamphetamine out of the case because he believed the defense was going to use that. And he is very clear on the record. You know, he, he talks very clearly about the role of methamphetamine in this case. Uh, you know, someone of great integrity. Um, in my being in Laramie last week, what I noticed was that a lot of the people that live in the town who came out were like, you know, thank God someone after 15 years is telling the truth. We've known this all this time, right? Whereas I find in the academic community, there's a little bit more because the academic community has, in many ways, embraced the narrative and, you know, I understand it. I mean, as someone whose political sentiments have typically been on the left, that I know what this moment was as a seminal moment, but they want to hold on to that moment because this is what we got behind. And let me just give you a couple of quick examples of people that I admire. You mentioned Moises, but Tony Kushner. When this crime happened, you know, I think it was a week or two after the crime happened, Tony had a piece in The Nation where he vilified the uh, religious right conservatives and, and blame them for Matthew Shepard's murder and said, you have blood on your hands and you're the part, you know, you folks did this. And I'm sorry, you know, with all due respect to Tony, Trent Lott and Pat Robertson, as much as their ideas are despicable to me, they had nothing to do with Matthew Shepard's murder. So, you know, uh, academically, uh, certainly um, I've noticed that uh, Fellow journalists have been much more responsive to the story, but critics, uh, the New York Times Book Review, the Washington Post, and others have completely ignored the book like it wasn't written. On the other hand, Kirkus Reviews, Publishers Weekly, Library Journal, People Magazine, there have been very, very strongly positive reviews. But the New York Times, I don't think, really wants to have their, you know, have an independent journalist correct them for their inaccurate reporting. Roger, could I extend your point? Just I would never slow you. <laughs> uh, Roger, I think to ask whether you can identify changes in the world in which you are interacting, the police, et cetera, et cetera. Do you like? Uh, can you identify the initial inclination that you, as an individual, might have had to oh. begin to change? Yes. And, and that happened several times. Initially, when I first saw this anonymous letter, I thought, oh my god, what is this? I just spent eight, I just spent eight months working on a screenplay. And I thought, you know, it's like I, I wish that I hadn't seen the letter. So there were places along the way where I really thought I was going to put the story aside and not continue with it. Because initially, when I started to mention it to a number of friends, and particularly gay friends, they would be, how can you do this? How can you do this? This is going to this is going to this is going to hurt the cause of gay rights. It's going to so there were steps along the way where I had to make a decision: Am I going to go forward with this story or not? And uh, you know, obviously, I decided to go ahead with it. But there were moments where I really wrestled with it. But could you characterize the inclination? The inclination to do it? Yeah. Um, the inclination to do it was that and and. There's a, there's a story early on in the book. The inclination to do it was, he could have been me, okay? Meaning, I had placed myself in a situation in Wyoming years earlier where something dangerous could have happened to me. And what 
Initially, what pulled me into the story was the idea that a horrific crime like this could have happened to me. What are you going to follow up one question? <laughs> uh, Before they turn the lights off. How are you doing, Stevens? I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm, I'm driving them home. So I'm <laughs> For the benefit of everyone. Right. Just in terms of the, the, you know, the follow-up of Stuart's question, I understand, you know, as I understand you very well, I understand as a gay person, why you would get interested in the story from your perspective. But sometimes when I've heard you talk about it, mm. Uh, and the, the promotion for the book, you mentioned your gayness as a factor. Right. And I wonder how you deal with the contradiction that, you know, the, for me, the compelling part of this is that the journalism stands for itself. It doesn't matter if you're gay or not in right. terms of whether you can do the story. How does, your, how does your description of your gayness, not in terms of your motivation for writing this, but in terms of, uh, a perception of credibility play in. I mean, should it have no factor at all? Do you, you know, tell people that? Wait a minute, it's it's not who I am as a person, right. but it's it's my <coughs> credibility as a yeah. journalist. How yeah. do you deal with this? Well, Ken, I one of the things I really wrestled with is: do I do this uh, in a more third person, straight objective style, or do I write it in a first person point of view? Mm -hmm. And one reason, since I had already done the ABC News Hour, and that was done in that style, which is the corporate style of ABC, I felt that I wanted to really, you know, take the reader through the journey that I went on and how gradually I put the pieces together. But I'll be honest with you, I think it was important to write it as a gay man because I actually believe that had I not, you know, if, or if I was someone else, then the charges of homophobia and all that would have been, would have, would have been worse. It wasn't so much calculated. I just had to say, how does this story feel inside me? And the way the story felt was, this is important to me as a gay man. Yes, there really is anti-gay hate, and there is violence against gay people. But this is, this is the fullness of a human tragedy that transcends whether you're straight or gay or you know, bisexual, transgender, whatever. It's human. Yes? Okay. Um. You know what, it's interesting because even if everything you've said is true, it doesn't so much disprove or turn into a lie, this other narrative, it complicates it. But there's multiple things for me that are still questions. Like, mm -hmm. first of all, I mean, what it reminds me of more than anything else is a book um, that I, I read in a tutorial last semester by Jean Genet, The Thief's Journal. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Yeah, but it's very much but it about been since college. So. Yeah, it's very much about sort of um, these <coughs> characters who live in you know in a world that in some ways is kind of similar of criminality, violence, ultimately murder of, of one man by another when at one point they've been lovers. And I don't think that any of these things really preclude each other. I don't think that being a sort of semi-closeted bisexual who does drugs precludes the fact that at some point when you kill someone, you're coming into contact with a, you know, in this case with a body that's marked with this homosexual specificity. Does that make it a hate crime? I think is a really interesting question. You know, the fact that there's this retrospective invocation of the homosexual panic de defense. The note you read, that didn't say to me, oh, this doesn't have anything to do with being gay. It's all, but, it, but it, it's all very, for me, multi-layered, ambiguous. You know, people are riven with complexity um, in this case, you know, like it's, you're almost implying that doing drugs evacuates you of agency. That to me would be a very disturbing conclusion because then, you know, that, I mean, that just seems like such an ethical morass. But, you know, on the other hand, I think that, um, that it's very rare that somebody really does come along this way that we wish they did, you know, except in very particular historical circumstances. Well, I can say it's happened to me personally. I have been chased down the street that people by people who said fucking nigger, fucking dyke, and then attacked me physically yeah. numerous times. So it does happen, but it's not that common. More likely things that happen in life to any of us, whether we're black or gay right. or you know, whatever, it's things happen in these really convoluted ways. It's very rare that anything's so straightforward. And I think what this shows to me, and I think it's, I'm glad that you did it, I think it's really interesting. I think it's, it's you know, wonderful that it's thrown people in a crisis because 
it does it does help to show us how how difficult it is to define what hate is and you know that yes. people people aren't aren't so clear and I think it's it's dangerous when we, when we construct these incredibly like polarized like kinds of um, and that's I mean, just, that is one of the so reasons that's what I get out of yeah. it yeah and thank you because it is one of the reasons I wrote the book is because the, pub, the established public narrative was so much of a black and white story. You know, two different parties from two different sides of the railroad tracks, you know, the homophobic redneck thugs and Matthew. And in fact, their worlds, maybe class-wise, but their worlds were actually a lot closer. They, so, they, had a lot of the, they had the same friends. They socialized together. They socialized together in Doc's limousine. So while I, while I agree with what you're saying about the possibility of hate there is a factor, and I certainly don't mean to give it all over to methamphetamine, that that's the excuse for everything. I'm not saying that, but what I am saying, and I do agree with the prosecutor, who says that if this case had gone to trial, if there was a hate crime law in Wyoming at the time, or a federal hate crime law, he is convinced that the proof wasn't there to prove the hate crime, and I, I have to say, I feel the same way about it in this particular case even with these other motives, because the burden would have been there to prove that the reason they attacked Matthew Shepard was because he was gay. And I think that that, with the available evidence, has really unraveled. Yeah, I mean, I don't think Genet would be in favor of hate crime legislation. No. <laughs> the book of his I know better is Saint Genet, and I, I mean, uh, of sorts on Saint Genet. I don't, if I read the, it's the Thieves. The, the Thieves Journal. The Thieves Journal, if I did, it would have been in high school, so I can't it's comment, a but yeah. I missed that thing. <laughs> please, please join me in thanking Stephen Harris.